to watch for the signs. My name is Jared. If you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe, like this video if you end up liking it, leave your thoughts and opinions down in the comments below. Also make sure to share it. Okay, so I don't know about you guys, but <clears throat> I feel like we're at kind of a critical point in this Russia-Ukraine war, um, simply because now the, the voting uh, for the referendum is done. Um, that finished up what I don't even know what's what's today <laughs> um, it finished up on Tuesday so two days ago and um, we're gonna go over the most recent news and I, I'm no expert I but I feel like this is like a critical time right uh, so what I wanted to do is look at what's going on right now because it looks like Russia is uh, poised to annex these four regions of Ukraine I want to look at, um, you know, current maps of the conflict. I found this really cool website right here that shows a current map of what's going on. Um, I wanted to look at Ukraine or Russia's other um, regions that it's uh, interfered with in Georgia and and stuff like that. <clears throat> Excuse me. I wanted to look at this situation with all these uh, men that are fleeing Russia uh, to get away from the draft. And uh, it, it is, this is really something else that's happening right now. Uh, I want to look at the uh, the pipeline. What is it? The Nord Stream uh, pipeline. So there, there's kind of a lot to talk about in this one. So I'm going to start here. This is New York Times, updated an hour ago. <clears throat> uh, Russia to push ahead with land grab in Ukraine after sham votes. Uh and of course, that, that's according to New York Times opinion. I, I don't really, I, I don't know, you guys. The, the world is very complicated and there's propaganda everywhere. So I, I tend to just, I just want to look at the facts and not try to like so much interpret things too much. Because uh, I don't know. Uh, I think the, the world is just very, very complicated. Okay, so here we go. Uh, you see these right here that are put up in a red square. Uh, it says, banners read Donetsk, Luhansk, Zaporizhia, uh, Kurzon, Russia, in Red Square in central Moscow on Wednesday. Okay, so they're, they're gearing up for tomorrow, essentially. The Kremlin announced that it would hold a ceremony on Friday, that's tomorrow, to, be absorbing, to begin absorbing the Ukrainian territories, uh, pressing ahead with a widely condemned annexation effort of lands that Russia has invaded but failed to fully control, and even as Ukrainian forces make gains on the battlefield. And we'll look at that in just a minute on that map. President Vladimir V. Putin will deliver a voluminous, voluminous speech, uh, his spokesman said on Thursday, seeking to ignore his military, his military's struggles in Ukraine, rising domestic dissent and worldwide denunciations of referendums in the occupied regions. Uh, where some were made to vote at gunpoint. Um, again, I, I mean, when it says gunpoint, I'm sure that there there were soldiers there. Uh, I don't know if that's being twisted where it's like, oh, they were pointing guns at us. or I, I, I don't know. I'm not trying to defend them. I just, I'm not a big fan of um, any sort of propaganda or twisting things. I, I value truth, you know. Um, was the vote a sham? Yeah, maybe it was. It could be. Um, although I, I also know that there's a lot of, um, basically ethnically, ethnic Russians essentially in Ukraine. Uh, so maybe they, they, they're like, yeah, so, uh, that doesn't mean that it's a sham. Um, now is it legal? That's another question. But anyway, as the Kremlin prepared a show designed to present a sheen of legitimacy to its illegal annexation, the authorities in Moscow put up billboards and a giant video screen in Red Square and announced road closures for Friday. State media described it as preparations for a rally and concert, quote, in support of the outcome of the referendums, end quote. Uh, the billboards proclaimed Donetsk, Luhansk, Zaporizhia, Kurzon, Russia, uh, naming the regions in southern and eastern Ukraine where Russian proxy officials staged votes in the last week. All four regions are partially occupied by Russian troops and the, re and the referendums put on hastily in the face of the military setbacks for the Kremlin purported to return big majorities in favor of joining Russia. 
In a carefully orchestrated process, the Russian proxy leaders in the territories were also expected to sign agreements with Moscow on Friday. Okay, so the, these different territories, this is going to happen tomorrow where they're signing papers. Uh, the Constitutional Court, which is seen as a rubber stamp for the Kremlin, would then approve the agreements and they would be ratified bo by both chambers of Russia's parliament. At the same time, the Kremlin would introduce a draft law on the admission of the territories into Russia, uh, which would be approved by the lower house of parliament, the state Duma. Once Russia's federal council passes the bill, it would be signed into law by Mr. Putin. The Duma's speaker, uh, Vyacheslav Volodin, uh, announced on Wednesday that du the Duma should hold its accession sessions to approve the annexation next Monday or Tuesday. Okay, so they're the the different regions are going to sign their papers tomorrow. They're going to have a celebration and a rally on Red Square tomorrow, and then uh, everything should be <coughs> excuse me should be finalized on either uh, Monday or Tuesday. Okay, so it looks like that's what we're looking at right now. Um, let's see, was there anything else that I know? Okay, so let's go ahead and let's take it. Take a look at the map. Uh, I'm really glad that I found this map. Okay, so red uh, indicates land that Russia currently has control of, and then blue, right here. This is territories liberated from Russian forces. Okay. So in other words, at one point, Russia was in these blue areas. You'll see that everything's kind of consolidated right down here in the southeast of the country. Right. This is Ukraine right here. And um, I'm kind of surprised because it looks like uh, Russia, it was coming in from the north as well. I, well, I knew that. You know, and then we have Belarus, that's an ally with Russia in this in this effort. And um, anyway, so they it looks like they've been completely pushed back in the north and the, the northeast. But now uh, this is where things are at. And, um, you know, this on this map, it's kind of hard to see because there's so many different like labels and stuff like that. Um, but. If we look here, this is on uh, BBC, shows the same thing. You can see more clearly the territories, uh, the provinces, whatever they are, that are being occupied. Uh, Luhansk, Luhansk is basically completely taken. Uh, Donetsk, only about half. Only about half of it is. Uh, Zaporizhia. <laughs> Sorry, that's really fun to say. Zaporizhia. Uh, it looks like about maybe three quarters of that. Uh, is taken and then curse on almost all of it. So I guess the question that I have once this happens on Monday or Tuesday, um, I, I assume that they're, they're annexing the entire region, not just the area that Russia is currently in. So what happens at that point? Uh, I, the, you know, the fighting is going to continue, but Russia has said that once this happens, uh, they're going to consider this Russia and, and as though it's an attack on Russia. And they've been threatening the use of nuclear, nuclear weapons. Um, they've been threatening the use of, I guess there's like a, basically a distinction between tactical nuclear weapons and strategic nuclear weapons. Tactical would be more of a, um, relatively speaking, more of a conventional nuclear we we weapon, the type that was used in Japan during World War II, like a, a low-yield weapon, opposed to like the gigantic like hydrogen bombs and stuff like that. So um, it, seems, it seems like the consensus, from what I can tell, is that they would use a smaller nuclear bomb, uh, otherwise known as a tactical nuclear bomb, similar to Japan in World War II. So uh, my question is, you know, would they, they would annex it and then would they be like, hey, you all better get out. You have this amount of time to get out. And then after that, we're going to use a nuclear bomb. I don't know. Uh, or something along those lines, possibly. Because um, I, 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 I doubt that Ukraine would just stop. Uh, the United States... 
I should have pulled this up. The U.S. is giving, let's see, U.S. gives Ukraine aid. Um, 20 hours ago, U.S. announces an additional $1.1 billion in military aid. So it seems like Ukraine and the United States are expecting to continue this for some time. And I've read that Russia believes it's going to happen for some time. But I guess my question is, with with Russia's definition that this is now their territory, would that make it more likely that they would use nuclear bombs? I, I don't know. So you can see here there's all sorts of things going on. You can click on this where it says News Live. And, uh, you know, the symbols here indicate what's going on. This is like a bomb or a missile or something. Um, at Novopavlivka and Zaporizhia, uh, directions, Russian army, army shelled that place, 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 all those places. Uh, General Staff of Armed Forces of Ukraine says in the morning report. This was eight hours ago. So uh, Russian shelling happened right there and then you can see all these other things there's bomb symbols and ak-47 symbols this one says ukrainian military repelled russian attacks near these different places da, 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 da. general staff of armed forces of ukraine says in morning report okay um here's a symbol that looks like a nuclear bomb what is that okay it's just missile strike reported at Zolot 5. Okay, so that's what we have going on. Uh, still a lot of fighting, obviously. What's going to happen? I don't know. We'll just have to see. Let's move on. I wanted to do a quick review <coughs> of what, what's happening because now, now that this is going to happen, this is like all but certain at this point, um, is Russia just going to keep keep taking different provinces? I don't know. It seems like their rationale for taking these ones is because uh, you have these like ethnic Russians or people that more identify as Russian in the east part of the country. And so would they stop there? I don't know. Um, I looked at this Wikipedia article. Uh, I wanted to look at these different provinces by population. And it turns out that Donetsk is the largest. So Donetsk is like the California of Ukraine. It has a population of 4.4 million. And then Luhansk and Zaporizhia um, are within the top 10. Let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Zaporizhia is at the number 8 spot for 8th largest uh, province. And then Luhansk is at number 6. Number six. So these are, these are big. You know, it's let's compare let's compare it to the United States. Um, list of U.S. states by population. Okay, let's pull this up. I just want to see what it would be like um, if this was like happening to us. And this isn't a perfect comparison. So Donetsk is like the California of Ukraine. Uh, Luhansk at the number six spot would be like Illinois, and then Zaporizhia is um, Georgia. And then we also have all the way down here Kurzon. Uh, that's toward the bottom. Uh, let's see where that's at. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one. Curzon is at the twenty-one spot, so that would be like taking Colorado. <laughs> so, so sorry, I, I know it's like a serious situation, but so it would be like someone taking Colorado, Georgia, Illinois, and California from us so it, it would be a big deal obviously uh taking any territory would be a big deal it wouldn't even matter if there's any population there it's like it belongs to us so um that's kind of that's well, that's the situation um now you may or may not already be aware uh this is not the first time that russia has done this kind of thing um mo notably the, the last time that it happened was with crimea and that was uh, part of Ukraine, right? And they annexed it. 
Um, if we go to, let's see, go here, this article called Russian Occupied Territories. So we have, okay, so we have a timeline of, of them taking territory. So the first one was essentially Transnistria um, in 1992. Transnistria is right here. Um, it's supposed to be part of Moldova, um, but it's this weird piece of land right here uh, that looks like a snake or something else. And it's on the west side of Ukraine. Um, I pulled up the facts for that. Uh, Transnistria, officially the Pridnestrovian Moldovan Moldivian Republic is an unrecognized breakaway state that is internationally recognized as part of Moldova under military occupation by Russia. Okay, so that since 1992. Most Transnistrians have Moldovan citizenship, but many, many also have Russian, Romanian, or Ukrainian citizenship. The main ethnic groups are Russian, Moldovans, slash Romanians, and Ukrainians. Transnistria, along with Abkhazia, South Ossetia, and Artsakh uh, is a post-Soviet, quote-unquote, frozen conflict zone. Okay, so we have that. They, they did that sin, uh, back in 1992. And then after that, we have um, the Georgia thing that happened. This was in 2008, and I, I remember that. Um, Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Okay, so if we look at the map again. Let's look at this one. We're talking about these two right here, number two and number three. Well, yeah, look at this. This is in the order of, uh, so Transnistria was first, and then you have these two in Georgia, and then Crimea, and then what's happening right now. Um, Abkhazia, officially the Republic of Abkhazia, is a partially recognized state in the South Caucasus. Um or Caucasus, yeah, recognized by most countries as part of Georgia, which views the region as an autonomous republic. So Russia went in there. There was a conflict. And if I'm not mistaken, at the same time, they also did South Ossetia. And did I highlight anything here? No, I guess not. Okay, so they did that there, <coughs> but they did not annex these two. Okay. Okay. Um, but there is a, a military uh, presence there. Okay, it's on this map too, uh, right here, see? Okay, so the question is, they successfully in 2014 took Crimea. Now, in 2022, they're taking these four. Uh, what happens next? Is that the end of it? Because I, I feel like once they successfully do that, that's not going to be the end of their grievances. Now, playing devil's, devil's advocate, um, if Russia really does have really good reason to, to fear the West, and I don't know, maybe they do, um, how do they take care of that problem? You know, th this, I guess, would be part of it. I know that they viewed Ukraine as kind of like a buffer uh, between Russia and the West. Ukraine wanted to uh, have closer ties to Europe. I think they even wanted to join the European Union. And so... Uh, yeah, so that was a problem for Russia because it's the equivalent, uh, roughly, if like, for example, if like the Soviet Union was still around and then Mexico or Canada wanted to become part of the Soviet Union or, uh, you know, become close allies with them, that would be a problem for us because it's like right on our border. Uh, we had that issue with Cuba when there was the Cuban Missile Crisis, right? So no one wants their enemy to like be right there on their border. Um, so I, I don't know what the end of this is going to look like. Nobody does, really. Um, but that's that's the situation right now. Okay, so let's move on. Now we had this that's happened. Sabotaged pipelines in a mystery. Who did it? Was it Russia? Let's read about it. Berlin. Two days after a pair of explosions under the Baltic Sea apparently ruptured giant natural gas pipelines from Russia to Germany, the consensus hardened on Wednesday that it had that it had been an, that it had been an act of sabotage, as the European Union and several European governments labeled it an attack and demanded an investigation. Experts said it could take months to assess and repair the damage to the Nord Stream One and Two pipelines. 
uh, which have been used as leverage in the West confrontation with Moscow over Russia's invasion of Ukraine. News of a possible attack on the lines heightened already intense fears of painful energy shortages in Europe over the winter. So it's a problem for Europe, right? Because they need that for the winter to stay warm. Uh, So who did it? Who did it? As the war began, Germany blocked the just completed Nord Stream 2 from going into service. And Russia later shut off the flow through Nord Stream 1, setting off a frantic effort in Europe to secure enough fuel to heat homes, generate electricity, and power businesses. So that's one way that you could look at it that um, Russia's like, oh, you want to play this game? You want to oppose us? You want to keep supporting uh, Ukraine with financial aid and political aid and so on and so forth? Uh, Maybe you'll just have to deal with a cold winter this winter. You know, so you could see Russia doing that, but um, says here, but others noted that one of two Nord Stream 2 pipelines was undamaged, leaving Mr. Putin the possibility of using it as leverage in the winter if the winter turns particularly cold. Many Western officials and analysts said sabotage would fit neatly into Mr. Putin's broader Russian strategy of waging war on multiple fronts using economic and political tools as well as arms to undermine Russia's or Ukraine's allies, excuse me, and weaken their resolve and unity. It demonstrates, it, it demonstrates to an early an already jittery Europe, how vulnerable its vital infrastructure is, including other pipelines and undersea power and telecommunic telecommunications cables. Uh, Russia's news outlets picked up on the Kremlin's allegation playing clips of Mr. Biden's vow on February 7th that if, if Russia, if Russian, what? That if Russia invaded, not Russian, that if Russia invaded, quote, then there will, there will be no longer, there will be no longer Nord Stream 2. We will bring it to an end. U.S. officials Uh, said he meant diplomatic and economic action, and noted that Mr. Biden had been proved correct when Germany halted the project. Uh, The pipelines were damaged at at a critical moment in the Seven-Month War. Kiev Kiev is, is making unexpected advances in the battlefield. Moscow has challenged Ukraine's Western backers with thinly veiled threats of nuclear retaliation. Uh, Russia seems on the verge of annexing large parts of Ukraine, and Mr. Putin's order to draft hundreds of thousands of men into the military is meeting broad resistance. And that's what we're going to look at in just a minute here. At first glance, it seems counterintuitive that the Kremlin would damage its own multi-billion, multi-billion dollar assets. Uh, but there is value for Moscow in fueling European fear, which pushes up prices in the gas market. And in short term... In the short term, analysts say it is not clear what Mr. Putin stands to lose, having already largely cut off gas deliveries to European countries in recent months. So I don't know. Um, The way that they're painting this is that uh, the only way that this the only person that this would benefit would be Putin. Right. Because it's already been cut off, I guess, um, or largely cut off. And so it's like, well, we'll just... uh, We'll up the Andes and we'll destroy all of it except for one pipeline. Um, that could be, you know. Now it is a way for Russia to make money. Um, I think it said that this isn't it a, a state-owned thing. Um, state. I thought I read somewhere that it's whose main owner is. Russia's state-controlled energy company, Gazprom, right here. So, I don't know, because when it comes to war and stuff like that, sometimes sometimes you do things to make it look like the other person actually did it, right? Um, I'm not saying that that's the case here. Um, I, I just, I don't know. You'll have to put what you think. Do you think that it was Russia that did it, or do you think that somebody else did it and that it's actually going to hurt Russia, maybe economically, or I don't know. I don't know enough about these things, but I'm just putting out some different ideas out there. 
Now, uh, it looks like Spain, okay, it says here, Spain says Nord Stream gas leaks likely a deliberate act and points the finger at Russia. So I guess that's the latest, that Spain thinks that Russia did it. But I don't know. I wanted to look at the Institute for the Study of War and uh, see what they had to say. Okay, this is their most recent key takeaways. And I highlighted a few. Russian authorities continue to send newly mobilized and undertrained recruits to directly reinforce severely degraded remnants of various units, including units that were previously considered to be Russia's premier conventional fighting forces. Uh, that does not sound good. I, I myself was in the army, and uh, I can tell you, when you first join a unit, if you're new to the military, you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> You don't really know what you're doing. Um, it, it'd be interesting to see the actual situation with individual units as this happens. But that's not good for Russia. Um, Russian forces continued unsuccessful ground attacks in Donetsk Oblast. Russian military recruitment officials are openly contradicting the Kremlin's publicly stated guidelines for mobilization to meet quota requirements even as Kremlin propaganda is attempting to change the public perception of partial mobilization. So I'm assuming what that means is that recruiters, and I mean, is this new to any military recruiters? Um, it seems like maybe they'll, they're getting some people in the military that uh, don't actually meet the criteria, right? It's like, you know, uh, you're going to go anyway. <laughs> That's a, that's a really sucky situation. Um, I'm assuming that's what this sounds like to me. Anyway, Russian authorities are beginning to restrict movement of Russian citizens into Russian border regions to cope with hundreds of thousands of Russian men attempting to flee the country. Yeah, that's kind of a big thing that's happening. Uh, I pulled up various articles uh, just to see where, where it's all happening. So... I'm not going to read the whole articles. I'm just going to point out. Okay, so Georgia is one of them. At at a North Asian border crossing between Russia and Georgia, where cars have been backed up for miles, independent Russian news outlets report a mobile recruitment center in the form of a black van with military enlistment office written on it. As you're trying to, as you're trying to flee the country, uh, that's that's a very good. That's very good. Black van, military enlistment office. Um, okay, so Georgia. Uh, just to remind you, let's see. I have a map up here. I'll put it at the end. Okay, so we have Russians. Okay, so here's Russia, right? This big, huge, gigantic piece of land, and then over here between the Caspian and the Black Sea, you have Georgia. So we have. Uh, Russians that are trying to go down here into Georgia. Okay. Uh, another makeshift draft office rep was reported along Russia's northern border at a crossing with Finland. So it's happening up all the way up here. All right. There's this whole um, long border uh, between Russia and Finland right here. So people are trying to go to Finland. Let's see, was there anything else down here? Uh, the Georgian government said some 78,000 Russians had entered the country since the, mo the mobilization was announced. Let's see. Cars wait in line on the road for the Verkny Lars checkpoint on the Russian-Georgian border. Okay. Uh, people walk toward the border crossing at Verkny Lars between Georgia. Uh Okay, the government of Kazakhstan, another nation that shares a huge southern border with Russia, in, s said Tuesday that roughly 98,000 Russians had fled there. And Kazakhstan is this big country just right underneath Russia. So a bunch of Russians are going there. Okay, what else do we got? Russian men leave country fearing call to fight in Ukraine. Turkey, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Serbia, uh, where Russians don't need visas. So those are some other places. So we got, let's, uh, okay, 
let's go to okay so turkey turkey is over here it doesn't actually share a border with russia but um unless like they swim over here or take boats or something like that so they said turkey armenia azerbaijan and serbia here's armenia here's azerbaijan azerbaijan does share a little bit of a border with russia right here uh serbia is over here um it it's like it's a landlocked country and uh it's kind of far away from russia but anyway some russians are going there because you don't need um, a visa some russian some russian men also fled to neighboring belarus uh russia russia's close ally but that carried risk the Nasha Neva newspaper, one of the oldest independent newspapers in Belarus, reported that Belarusian, Belarusian uh, security services were ordered to track down Russians fleeing from the draft, find them in hotels and rented apartments, and report them to Russian authorities. So probably not your best um, route to take, right? In fact, early on when, when they were still talking about invading uh, Ukraine. There was talk about Belarus uh, helping with that, aiding Russia. So, you know, this might as well be Russia, essentially, Belarus. But you have Russians going there, and that's over here on the western border, uh, relatively close to Moscow. Let's see. Is there anything else there? Let's see. Ukraine or Russians flee to Mongolia after Putin's mobilization order. Um, Mongolia is over here. Okay, it is between Russia and China. Uh, this part of the country right here, Mongolia. Okay. Let's see. Three thousand Russians had entered Mongolia via the via the crossing since Wednesday. Most of them men. Okay, but what about over here? Satellite photos show ten mile long traffic jam at Russian border. Uh, we already saw this though. This is the one uh, going to Georgia. Yeah. Uh, Finland, Finland, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania have said they would restrict entry for Russians uh, this week amid attempts to flee. So that is going to be over here, right? Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. We already talked about Finland. Okay, what's this? Russians flee to neighboring countries amid mobilization. Uh, Georgia said more than 53,000 Russians have entered the country since last week, while officials in Kazakhstan said 98,000 had crossed into its territory. The Finnish Border Guard Agency said more than 43,000 arrived in the same period. Media reports also said a another 3,000 Russians entered Mongolia, which shares a border with uh, the country. So there, there's some more of the numbers. Okay, what about this one? The Barents Observer. Okay, now this one, th now this is uh, Norway. Crowds of young men fleeing from conscription on Tuesday morning head heading toward Norway from Murmansk. Controls are intens intensified at Titovka checkpoint. Norway is just this tie it only borders russia just barely right here so a very small border but they're even going up into norway so the moral of the story here is that the the short of it is that russians are fleeing into every possible neighboring country except for i haven't seen anything for china china uh, has this border right here with russia right um, haven't seen any Russians going to Japan or anything like that. Uh, I'm not aware of any coming to the United States, but I don't know. So they, they're just, they're fleeing in mass because they don't want to be part of this. They don't want to be part of the undertrained troops that are going to Ukraine, um, to what seems to be a losing war. 
I, I, again, I'm surprised that this is happening. I, I would have thought that Russia could have taken care of this. I, I, I don't know about you, but I was expecting at the beginning of the invasion that they were going to take the entire country just the same way that we took Iraq and Afghanistan. You know, I thought that cap- that Russia was capable of the same thing. Again, I'm not a military expert, but um, I'm just kind of surprised. And I just I want to know where this is going to go. Nobody really knows. But here's where we're at. They're going to take some more land. Okay, well, that's going to be it for this one. So if you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe, like this video. If you liked it, leave your thoughts and opinions down in the comments below. Also, make sure to share it, and I'll talk to you guys later.